Hi, everyone, and uh, first, thank you for two very interesting presentations so far. Uh, I can tell that I'm uh, really recognizing a lot of these issues in my work. Uh, and now let's go to the other end of the engineering phase, so the quality and what the customers perceive. Uh, as uh, you can see here, uh, the topic will be perceived quality and perceptual robustness. And I will talk in general automotive in industry. Uh, but especially at CEVT, or CEFT, as we call it. Um, my name is Emily, and I'm leading the team of Proceed Quality Attribute Leaders. Let's see if this works. Uh, so the topic, I will uh, start a little bit, very shortly, about my background, um, because I, I don't think maybe anyone of you know who I am. Uh, I will also introduce you to China Euro Vehicle Technology, uh, I will talk about proceed quality of SEFT. I will talk a little bit about robustness in switches and controls because that is also uh, actually a quite new subject that we are dealing with right now. Uh, yes. I will talk a little bit about the methods that we use. Uh, also talk about, of course, geometry assurance in connection to quality. And in the end, I hope you will have many questions to me. So. Uh, my background, I started at Chalmers, uh, at Mechanical Engineering Department, um, reading my master thesis in product development, and um, I could say that there is where I started my quality career. My master thesis was, was about how geometrical deviation affects how it feels to drive the car. So all the chassis, um, camber, caster, toe angles of the vehicle. Uh, and the scope was to develop a tool so that we could pick out the worst in individual that is, it is completely within specification, so it is actually a car that you could buy if you have bad luck. Uh, and then we took that individual and we tried to drive it, and that didn't feel good. So that's where I got my eye up for quality. Uh, that led me into uh, Volvo cars this works, uh, where I worked uh, some years as an analysis engineer for proceed quality, mainly interior, but also attribute leader for complete vehicle. Uh, after uh, four years uh, at the proceed quality team, I joined CEVT. They were starting up a proceed quality team there, so they needed someone to lead the team and to develop the work methods. <laughs> And that's my current location. Maybe this works. So, how many of you have heard about CEVT before I, I got here? <laughs> some Swedish, <laughs> Swedish guys and some of you, yes. Uh, it's a quite new company. Uh, we started for about three years ago. Uh, and it was started as a joint R&D center for Volvo cars, between Volvo cars and Geely Automotive. And the scope was to find uh, or to develop a new platform, the CMA platform for cars, for C-segment cars. And it went really well. Uh, Geely, as a owner, were very satisfied. And uh, we are right now around 2,000 people. So in three years, we've grown from 60 people to 2,000 people, which is uh, a quite massive growth. Uh, in Sweden, we are located in Gothenburg, uh, quite close to our sister co company, Volvo Cars. Uh, in, we are have uh, also our Chinese colleagues, uh, of course, since we are building all, all of our cars in China, uh, around 500 Chinese colleagues. Uh, this is the office in China, just wanted to show you. We are located inside the Geely Research Institute, so we are quite close connected to the other sister company, which is Geely Automotive. Yes, so this is how it's all connected. Uh, we have the Geely Holding Group, uh, owner of Geely Automotive, Volvo Cars, London Taxi Company, you know, all these black cabs that you can in London, and also a education company. Uh, 
and safety somewhere in the middle between Geely Automotive and Volvo Cars. And this is what we do at SEFT. Uh, I talked a little bit about uh, that we started off as a platform company developing uh, the, the C-segment platform for Volvo cars and Geely Automotive. And we have now grown to creating products for a global market. We have our offices in Sweden, in China, and we also have a Geely design office working in San Francisco. So it's actually all around the globe. Uh, architecture development. Uh, top hat de development, we have actually grown from just being a platform company, architecture company, to doing complete top hat development. And this is where Proceed Quality comes in, because as soon as you start building top hats, which means everything as you as a customer can see, then we need to start putting focus on Proceed Quality. Uh, we also do, we have our design office doing complete vehicle design. Uh, we also look into advanced engineering, new technologies, because if you're going to launch uh, a new car, you also need to look forward and see, okay, where is the market heading and what do the customer want? And these are the de deliverables. Um, I won't go into too much detail about that because I really want to move on quickly to the reason why I am here and the reason for, um, yeah talking about perceived quality. Um, actually, perceived quality is quite of a big, I think it's a quite of a big subject because when you start talking about perceived quality with people who is not in the automotive industry, you get a lot of answers saying, okay, I think, do you work with this or do you work with that? Um, do you work with, uh, you can get all types of like, um, how it feels to, to drive the car or a different noise. Um, yeah, all, all different kind of, of guessing. Uh, but when I talk about perceived quality, uh, I talk about... Oh, sorry. Uh, this. This is how we de define perceived quality in SEFT, and I also know Volvo does the same since I work there. Uh, we can call it four different subcategories. The first one is geometry. You know, everything uh, is not nominal when you do it. So we have different par parameters that is affecting uh, what the actual outcome would be. Uh, we also look into appearance. Uh, we will look into material quality. We look into paint and surface finish. And we look into illumination, which is exterior and interior light appearance. Uh, the aim of this is to secure that the customer's first impression lasts. And I'm actually going to focus on two of these areas. I'm going to talk about geometry, and I'm going to talk a little bit about material quality. So, geometry and appearance quality. Uh, in this uh, area, we focus on setting requirements on fit and finish, so gap and flush between components. Uh, we set final demands on the vehicle so that we, uh, what can be accepted from a customer point of view. This is the car that we should de deliver uh, to our customers. We also look into see-through in split lines because if we have a big gap and a bad outcome, big variation, we can risk to see things between and inside the gap that we don't want to see. Uh, we also look into appearance of weld studs, for example. Uh, that can really bring down the appearance of a vehicle. Uh, we also make sure that we don't have a lot of uh, fixings, clips, uh, visible screws, etc. cetera. Um, everything should look neat and clean. And it should really, what, we, what we're aiming for is to really make sure that the design and the, and the design intent is fulfilled. I'm going to come back to this subject, but um, yes. Uh, just mentioning paint surface finish. Uh, this is actually the sheet metal appearance. So we look into orange peel, we look into color matching between parts, because same thing here uh, as geometry. You have one nominal appearance and you also have variation in paint 
because this is also a process parameter. Uh, you can have, if you, if you specify a white metallic on a vehicle, you can have different white metallic appearances. And you will also have a tolerance there saying that, okay, it could be a little bit brighter and a little bit darker, depending on the supplier. Uh, and as Dan was talking about here, we have different suppliers here. Uh, we buy in, for example, uh, the spoiler in some cases, uh, the tailgate spoiler, and that should be connected to the body in white that we do and paint in our own paint shop. So how do we make sure that these two colors are matching? So this is actually also um, has a lot of things to do with perceived quality. Um, we also have uh, one of the newer uh, areas, which is illumination. Uh, and illumination sets requirements on both interior and exterior lights of the vehicle. So headlamps, exterior, uh, both front and rear. You have the turning signals. You have interior light, which is we go more and more into doing, uh, enhancing the design with different lighting techniques. Uh, you can see in new cars, they have these ambient lights. You can choose with which color you want, if you want red or green. Uh, and we make sure that it, uh, we have a harmony in the car. And the last area uh, is uh, material quality. Uh, the same thing here as for exterior paint. Uh, this is actually also maybe the same thing, but interior-wise mainly. Uh, when you create or, or you manufacture a part, and it should have a certain color, a certain gloss, and a certain grain. Uh, but one single part is not always exactly similar to the other part. So we will have a difference. So what we do, we specify the tolerance, what is allowed, which variation can we have, um, and then we, we um, verify it by looking towards a uh, material master. Uh, we also have in this area the touch and feel of switches and controls, because this is also a very, it's a very important area, because you have everything you do when you're sitting and driving a car, you're mostly using switches. And we have a lot of switches in the car. You have, um, uh, you have window switches, you have switches on your steering wheel, you have switches in the roof for all the lightings. Uh, you have controls for air vents. And if we have a bad feeling when you are using these uh, different controls, you get a really bad experience of the car. So this is an this is a, a, a area that is really connected to perceived quality. But then is the question, how do we set requirements on a feeling? That is a tricky part. Because what's, what's okay in Europe, for example, the new XC90, uh, if you've tried that one, uh, you can feel if, for example, the window switches, we have quite of a hard feeling. Uh, Europeans and um, actually also Americans usually want more of a hard feeling when pressing buttons. You really want to have that feedback that yes, something happens when I press a button. Um, so that is what actually what the requirement has been built on and that is what we know here in Europe. But after talking to our Chinese colleagues, they have actually said to us that they don't like this feeling at all. They want a more soft feeling. So when you press, you want to push down your window, they want a more soft feeling to this. So it should uh, maybe have a little delay or something. Um, and here is, is quite of a difference in the market. Um, and it's a, it's a challenge because if you, wanna, if you wanna launch a vehicle and have it to the global market, which market should you really prioritize? because we're going to have the same buttons in China as we have in Sweden, as we have in the US. And I actually don't have a good answer to this. Uh, I have an example here of a touch requirement for door switches. So as you can see, I'm going to point here so that you don't feel outside. Um, we have a force and we have a distance. So when you're pushing a button, you have uh, this is how the requirement is set. You have the travel here, uh, the travel length and the peak 
and the force. So when you come up here, you have the peak force. Until here, it's not much happening. Uh, but here, when you start feeling your feedback, it gets an easier friction, and you push the, the window button down. And in the end, it's uh, uh, also more hard feeling when you come down to the bottom. And this can look, uh, depending on, on the axis here and what you have, uh, which, uh, which scale you have on these, uh, this diagram, you get a different feeling. And here we also have, uh, because you will have different suppliers here as well, uh, you will have one supplier for the instrument panel switches and you will have one supplier for the door switches and then you can have a third supplier for the air vent controls. So this is uh, what we really need to focus, uh, what we uh, at least at CEF need to focus on is to really get the knowledge out to our suppliers. What do we want? We need to, to start getting them to think about perceived quality and, and also here we could have variation uh, when it comes to, to the feeling. Right now we are, um, how we are defining, oops, what happens now? Sorry. Um, how we are doing right now is actually that we choose a supplier for example for the switch pack in the doors for the window switches. Uh, we're taking a lot of samples from the supplier they send us, let's say, 10 different uh, parts, uh, and then we try it. We basically push the buttons and we try it, and we, we say that, okay, this one feels like it's the best one. Take the, this one as a master and produce exactly the same one for a lot of vehicles. So that's how we do it for the switch robustness. Switch robustness. And maybe in a year I can come back and say, yeah, this is how it went out. But um, right now we don't really know the results. <laughs> if this was a successful method or not. Um, this is an area that we need to look into. So I'm actually uh, sending out a small question here to maybe DTU. Um, this is something that you can start looking into. So, um, Moving on from uh, switches, now I'm going to focus more on geometry. Uh, what methods and tools do we use for ensuring a good quality from sketch to a final and physical car? What methods do we use uh, at CEFT? Uh, also, I know the use of VCC because we have quite of a same way of working. Uh, if you've read engineering books and you have studied engineering, you might recognize this model. Uh, and this is what we are having. It's the base of our work in SEFT as well. We start with, on a quite high level, uh, putting requirements. We are requirement driven and verification driven. <clears throat> so uh, we start uh, to look at complete vehicles, breaking down uh, requirements down to systems, subsystems the system and finally to components uh, and then when we go the other way around we come to the end we come to the final customer uh, the end customer and the complete vehicle and if we translate this model into how we really work uh, I will show uh, this picture uh, this is our main deliveries during a car project we start complete vehicle we start very big uh, doing benchmarks. We have our uh, marketing team and our product planning team telling us this, this is the car that we want to build. This is, the uh, this is the car that the customer wants to have. From that we take in uh, a number of competitors, look at, looking at them, analyzing them from a geometry perspective, also in the other areas of perceived quality. Uh, we are measuring them. And, uh, this is quite hard also because often we only take in one car. So that's not really representative because that could be either in a, it can have a bad uh, tolerance outcome because you could, you could get a car that is really good or you could get a car that is not so good. So the ideal would be 
to actually take in a number of cars uh, from the same manufacturer, manufacturer <clears throat> and ideally also have them from different batches. Sorry. Sorry for my voice. <clears throat> uh, so what we do is that we, yeah, we measure the cars uh, geometry-wise. We look at the cars, how do they look like. Uh, and from that, we set our requirements. Uh, so we deliver that to the engineers, that this is want, what we want to achieve with our perceived quality uh, targets. Uh, then we go past the pre-program uh, pre start phase, and we start coming into the concept phase. This is where we refine the product. Uh, we go often down to two design themes, uh, going past program start here. We come down to one design team. And this is when we start to, to go down on, on going from a complete vehicle requirement and going down to system requirements. Um, saying that, okay, with this design theme, we have these system requirements. Uh, we start to do <clears throat> what we call non-nominal visualizations because what we, uh, what it, my experience is that if, uh, forgive me everyone who's working with design, but if you would let a des designer decide that this is the car that we should build, we would have zero gaps everywhere in the car and that's not possible uh, because everyone sitting in this room know that we don't live in a, a nominal world, we have variation. And if the engineers were supposed to decide how the car looked like, and we would have a box with like four split lines or something. So we are somewhere in the middle, and we are. It's also again what what uh, the previous uh, presenters has spoken about. We need to set a mindset that proceed quality and robustness. It's it's important, and we need to have that in from the beginning. Because if we do it wrong here, in the beginning. <coughs> In the end, when we start doing production and we see that, okay, this car cannot be assembled because we have, we have such a bad variation and we haven't taken that in account when designing from beginning, then we have a big problem and we have a big cost problem because that will be very expensive. So that's why we try to uh, very early do visualizations, trying to predict this is what we will have and with the variation that is calculated, this is what we will have and this is how it will look like. Uh, we come into industrialization phase uh, later on. Uh, I will talk a little bit about what I mean with DPA. Uh, and then after final data judgment, we say that, okay, we drop the pen, we don't do anything more, kick off the tools and start building the car. Uh, here we are also a part uh, of the verification phase, looking at the cars in the same way that we looked at our competitors in the beginning of the program. So, uh, DPA, during a car prog program, you have uh, approximately four types of freezes, engineering freezes, when they say, okay, now we have passed this phase, uh, we freeze the models, and if we should start building cars today, this is what the car would look like. So basically what we do after these design or engineering releases, uh, we take up the complete car uh, in a software called Team Center, which is used both by Volvo Cars and also uh, SEFT. Uh, where you can take up the complete e-boom, engineering bill of material. So every little screw, every little um, brick, uh, yeah, um, or not brick, I don't know the English word of it. Uh, but uh, from that to the complete door. So you, you see the complete vehicle. And what we do there is basically that we check uh, engineering execution. And how do we do it? Well, we, we try to look as, uh, on the car uh, on as customer uh, relevant position as possible, something that we call customer field of view. Uh, we look at all A surfaces, we open and close the doors, uh, the hood, and uh, we, make, uh, we take up all issues that we see. For example, big gaps, um, 
you can have uh, what we call rat holes, uh, sensitive geometry, split line layouts, and so on. So uh, what we mean by customer relevant position is that we don't look uh, we don't look at the appearance, for example, if you are laying underneath the car. So it's, uh, it's always when you're standing and walking around the car. So the purpose is to have a car that looks good in showroom uh, for the customer. When it, when, it, when it approaches the car, it should look good. For example, this one here. Uh, this is an example from, from uh, on a requirement uh, that we have. Uh, the muffler and the tailpipes, if you're standing eight meters rear of the car, looking at the car, uh, you should not see any disturbances underneath the car. It should look, it should fulfill the design intent. I don't know if you've ever driven behind a XC60, uh, you can really see through, they have these integrated end pipes, uh, but you can really see through and you can see the small end pipe inside the big end pipe, so it really looks fake. Uh, and that's something that we want to avoid. Uh, as I said, we, uh, we perform it on frozen data after each engineering loop. Uh, so we actually have uh, one more loop after this, and that is the uh, final data judgment freeze, saying that, okay, this is where we drop the pen and we don't do anything more. We also check that uh, engineering status. Uh, we are also working a lot with, as I said, uh, trying, to, uh, uh, trying to predict the outcome, uh, trying to say that, okay, this is the car that we will build in a very early phase. So we work a lot with visualizations. Uh, one software that we use is Autodesk V-RED, uh, which is really good because you can add uh, correct material. You can have graining, you can uh, reflect shadows, you can uh, make transitions. Um, first, I, I, uh, I wanted to show more pictures here, but unfortunately what we're doing are so far uh, classified. <laughs> so I can't show you more than this, uh, but this is, uh, uh, this is the tailgate and this is the body side. So this is the split line between the tailgate and the body side. And as you see, this is where we have one problem, for example. And this is in a nominal position. Um, so this is what we do. We try to predict the future, or the future, but the outcome uh, of the vehicle before the car is, is actually built. So how is uh, geometry assurance connected to quality? Uh, you might already know the answer uh, because it's very connected. And at uh, CEFT, we have, you can say that we have three roles working with geometry, except proceed quality, because we put the requirements on the geometry. Uh, but these are the ones working with fulfilling and assuring that the requirements that we put on the vehicle will be fulfilled. Uh, in the concept phase, we have the dimensional engineers working with uh, component tolerances, so they set uh, requirements on, on uh, surfaces and uh, yeah, putting geometry demands on it, um, setting up the geometry system, for example, all the reference points, and, uh, and also doing the tolerance calculation uh, using RDNT software, um, if you've heard of it. I guess many of you know which one it is. That's one we're using at CEFT. Uh, during the industrialization phase, we have what we call manufacturing geometry engineers who takes over they actually have a handshake saying, okay, these are the calculated requirements. Uh, these are the ones where you, that we should measure, uh, measure up in our uh, uh, different modules. They do a geometry pre-planning, pre preparing for the real production, uh, where geometry engineer takes over. So they look, they, they check geometry in running production, making sure that we don't start off with with one variation and then after a few years we're totally off because we want the vehicle to look the same when it comes out from job one the first day uh, as it does uh, many years after uh, until end of life. So uh, they are very important uh, in that uh, daily work in the factories. 
And then we have the supplier quality management, and I, I added that one because they are also very important, making sure that we get the right deliveries from our, uh, from our suppliers. Um, doing this and, and working with geometry assurance, there are some things that we can do in order to make it easier for the geometry engineers and the manufacturing geometry engineers. This is an example from the Volvo SMV90. Uh, I worked with this one and took the geometry requirements on this one. Uh, as you can see, you have this big uh, chrome deco, and it's a nightmare as a geometry uh, perceived quality attribute leader because you have relations in every direction, X, Y, and Z. So what do you prioritize? Um, we have actually made a quite of a, uh, it was a good work with this together with a cross-functional team, engineers, perceived quality, designers. Um, you see this shelf here from glove box. You can take out variation here uh, without noticing, without the customer noticing. Same thing here above the deco. You have an X relation here, which means that it's not visible when it's uh, variating in the Z direction and not either in the X direction. So you can really focus you can really focus on this gap that is visible. So that is a, a, one example on how you can do and really um, get the desired pro product that you want. Because as I was seeing too, uh, in the real wor world, nothing is nominal. Um, this is also an example from the Volvo V40. Um, you get another outcome in reality than what you have in the Katia nominal models. And that is why the focus on geometry is very important throughout the entire development process. It's very important that all, because you have a, a tolerance stack up, so it's very important that all systems are within specification. Because even though you have one system that is not visible for the customer, in the end when you put on the hood, for example, you get this hood to fender relation, which is visible for the customer. So if if these underlying things is not following up to specification, then we will have a problem also for the customers. So, um, I will leave you with a bit of a cliffhanger here because I don't have any result to show you. Since we're building cars right now and we don't have a final car at SEFT, um, I can't really show much. So, I leave you with that. Um, and the important thing here is to set the mindset in the beginning so that we have robust design and perceived quality uh, when starting to designing products. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Incredibly interesting presentation. I think we have time for a few questions. Gotcha. <laughs> I really like that. Uh, <laughs> I like that microphone. <laughs> Thank you for uh, very quality. I have a question. You haven't talked about the sounds, uh, quality sounds. Yes. Um, actually, not. But uh, it is part of quality, I would say, because it's really, I mean, opening, closing doors. Um, also when driving, when you have this uh, vibrating sound, it's really annoying uh, if you buy a car and then you are out driving on the highway and, it, and you hear uh, vibration noise. Uh, but that actually is uh, a specific attribute, but um, we're, we're not working with it in, in SEFT, unfortunately. Like yeah. Kind of, uh, <laughs> uh, absolutely. But that's what you're setting with. Who's making these decisions? And how do you? How do you um, do yes. Um, I would say it's really it's what we do every day, <coughs> making priority prioritizations. Because as you say, if you have a really cool feature and what the design department they say that okay, this is really what we want to to uh, achieve, and this is the design intent. 
Um, and you have the engineer saying, no, it's not possible because we have the manufacturing and it will not look good in the end. Um, you need to do some sort of, um, yeah, you weigh everything uh, towards what is most important. And um, it is an ongoing discussion. Um, so depending on what, what the marketing, because here is also very important, the product planning and marketing guys saying, okay, because this is the car that we're going to, sell out what what should it be what should the car stand for so absolutely we'll work with that and then it's a ongoing discussion okay, a last question <laughs> so is the, i saw on your first is this working yeah, it's yes <laughs> that's on your first slide that you um, mentioned the um, first impression should last yes so but i don't think you touched on kind of how do you make That's sure that, uh, yeah. that, uh, that it ages with grace instead of uh, uh, kind of uh, some surfaces, chrome yeah. surfaces falling off? Yeah, falling off. off and mm. Buttons getting uh, strange wares. I have this very good example if you want to see it afterwards. It's a Volvo <laughs> key. Yeah. And I wouldn't say it ages with grace. Uh, nope. Due to material <laughs> choice, actually, it looks like a dog has had it in its mouth, but it's. Yep. it's uh, so, do you also go into these things? Absolutely. We, um, we have a team uh, working with uh, surface materials, so all this, the technical specification of that. And we also have that in our minds when we, when we give, um, because basically how the work is that design sets, okay, we want these colors interior of the car. We want to have a charcoal gray top of the IP, and then we want a blonde uh, IP lower, for example. Uh, and depending, as you say, on the type of material that you choose, we will have different aging uh, outcome and results. And um, we try to give us, uh, we are just focusing on the first impression. When you buy the car, uh, it should look good then. But we have a supporting group. <laughs> yeah, we have a supporting group that is uh, having requirements on this as well. So um, absolutely, you take that into consideration. and. All right, thank you, Emily. Okay, thank you.